Hi, my name is Paul Boven, and I'll talk about VLBI with GNU Rabbit. Sorry, no, VLBI with good start. VLBI with GNU Radio and White Rabbit. Well, GNU Radio, you all know. White Rabbit, you have maybe heard a little bit about. Um, I work at the Joint Institute for VLBI in Europe called Jive, and in my spare time, I also do a lot of radio astronomy on this old dish here, the 25-meter Dwingelo dish that you might have heard of. So, a little bit of an introduction, why are we doing this VLBI stuff? If you take like the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, say at 600 nanometer wavelength and a size of 2.4 meters diameter, that you can easily, it's just a ratio, uh, calculate that the resolution that you can get out of it is like a 0 0.06 arc second, where, where, you, where you have 360 degrees, gets divided in minutes, gets divided in arc seconds, and this is a fraction of an arc second. Now, if you take a 25-meter telescope, so that's 10 times bigger, but you have a wavelength in the order of 6 centimeter, your resolution is suddenly 10,000 times worse. Actually, with this kind of resolution, you would have like 4 or 5 pixels on the full moon. So to get an equivalent resolution, to see the things in the radio spectrum that you also want to see in the optical, or that you can already see in the optical, you would actually need a dish of 250 kilometers. Yeah. Right, which we can't have, apparently. So the solution to this has been found is called Very Long Baseline Interferometry. So that's what the VLBI stands for. It is connecting radio telescopes all over the world um, and using them in phase as a giant, I would almost say, MIMO array. This chart shows the European VLBI network. It's not like... The United States, for instance, doesn't have any radio telescopes. Uh, they have a great VLBI network of, of their own, but I work for JIVE and we do the Joint Institute for VLBI in Europe. And we run the European VLBI network. So what can you do with VLBI? You can get unprecedented resolution. The image to the left has already been shown that is the uh, black hole in M87. And the resolution there is really uh, sub micro arc second. The image to the right is actually a very interesting image. You have like a radio source that's 11.7 billion light years away. And then between the radio source and us is a cluster of galaxies that's much closer. And the radio signal is actually being ba bent around this cluster by gravity. And that gives rise to this ring shaped structure called an Einstein ring. And the people who made this image were actually able to deduce the like mass distribution in the, in the galaxies, and also details about the, the very far away source that you could not possibly see itself. So if VLBI does not yet give you enough resolution, you can get more magnification if it happens to line up with some uh, very heavy galaxy cluster, for instance. So what do you need? You need a so VLBI in a nutshell. A virtual radius telescope where like, the diameter is comparable to the largest distance between the dishes. The resolution you get is on the order of a milli arc second, or even better sometimes. So all these telescopes look at the same source at the same time. Before you actually process the data correlated together, uh, because the Earth is rotating, and if you were at the equator, you, you'd actually be rotating at 456 meters per second. So all the Doppler shift uh, and all the delays to all the different telescopes from the directory that you're viewing in, they need to be taken out. Then you calculate the complex cross-correlation on each of the baselines, so from each telescope to each of the other ones. And you fill this in in a so-called UV plane where you have basically the wavelength as the two axes, and then if you do a Fourier transform of this, you actually get an image. Except it's a very poor image because most of this UV plane is empty because you didn't have a telescope at that particular distance. So you have to guess what the data would, would have been like and for that reason, there are very, very complicated algorithms to then um, make a very clean and nice image. So what you need is, first of all, a radio telescope. And not just one, you need multiple, because otherwise you can't do interferometry. As many as you can, as big as you can, of course. Each of those needs a very stable frequency source, because you want all those phases at observing frequencies of, say, 10 gigahertz. You want the phases to be stable to each other um, within 1,000 seconds. And you can't really do 
that over a piece of coax that you run from here to Germany. You need a lot of bandwidth because the more bandwidth we have, the more sensitivity ha we have. Bandwidth actually scares as the, or sensitivity scales as the square root of the bandwidth. You need a supercomputer uh, to do all the processing that comes with this. And then you need a lot of detailed work. Like you need very accurate telescope locations which actually take into account the fact that not only does the sea go up and down with the tides, but actually the earth deforms by up to 40 centimeters. You, know, no, you don't notice because everything around you does the same, but it goes up quite a bit and down again. All these details do you need to take care of. So for the rest of this talk, I'm sort of going down this list of things you need and see what I can find. So we start with a radio telescope. So in my spare time, I'm a volunteer at the Dwingelo radio telescope. Um, it's, it's a very ancient instrument. At one time, it was the largest fully, radio, fully steerable radio telescope in the world. It's a 25 meter diameter dish. And it nowadays is being run by volunteers of the Cameras Foundation. And I'm one of those. We do, first of all, maintenance, try and keep the instrument in order. We do radio astronomy, we do ham radio, uh, things like moon bounds. We do education and outreach. We do SETI, we do satellites. Uh, you certainly might have heard of some of our satellite observations that we've recently done. And then art projects and many other activities. On the left, you see the official opening in 1956 by Queen Juliana of the Netherlands. And I couldn't resist this. This is yesterday. This is actually our queen and our king. And in between those two, uh, two of our volunteers, they visited yesterday. And what you see on the right hand is what we showed them is a GNU radio plot of, in real time, of the galactic hydrogen, hydrogen line at 21 centimeters. <laughs> well, I see there's more royalists here. Okay, so a little bit more about the technical details, because that's what we're here for. For wideband observing like VLBI, like I said, uh, sensitivity scales with the square root out of the bandwidth. And now, you always run into financial limits. The amount of disk space you have, the amount of network throughput you have to get somewhere, and then to get the best sensitivity out of it, you want to use fewer bits. If you can represent your data with fewer bits, you can actually put more bandwidth into your link but your quantization noise gets worse. So that is a trade-off, and for VLBI, actually, we almost always use two-bit quantization, only two-bit. I know great Scott yesterday said they do it with one bit, we do two-bit quantization only. Now, two-bit quantization should not be difficult. It's simply you, 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 you left shift your, your values uh, until you have two bits. Turns out that, actually, it is a little bit difficult. There's two kinds of quantization. There's the C-style truncation, where everything between minus one and plus one actually gets rounded to zero. But in signal processing, we want more like anything between minus a half and plus a half to round down to zero, because otherwise you get like a huge discontinu discontinuity in your uh, rounding function. The nice thing is that new radio would do both. And uh, what you see here is a graph of all the values that round to zero. And Nicely, as expected, values between minus a half and plus a half, they round to zero, except every 8,192 samples, occasionally you get a much larger range that rounds to zero. And the reason for this is that um, most of the code is optimized through the, through the Volk library, and that uses SSE in this case, and does the right thing. But then there's a little few leftover samples that actually get processed in C, in, in the same block, and that the C-style sampling, uh, C-style rounding, and you get this effect. And apparently nobody had done, had looked at this in detail before, so this is the first time I kind of got involved as a contributor to the GNU radio project, saying, eh, that's not right. Fortunately, it's, it, it's been fixed now. Another challenge was high bit recording, and I'm telling you here how we did it, but maybe there are people here who have better solutions, and I would lo love to hear it. We had a X310 with, a two, with two twin RX modules, and at worst you can get, uh, or maybe I should say at best, you can get 12.8 gigabit per second out of that. And of course, if you have an expensive SDR like this with expensive models, etc., you want to actually capture that data, and that's not trivial. I could easily record to memory on my machines, but you, you run out of memory very quickly. I had a server that has like 36 disk slots, at 18 disks that I was made a RAID 0 out of it, and even with UHD, 
you can't really do any sensible bandwidth. You just start losing packets. And because we are very sensitive to the phase of the whole thing, as soon as we lose packets, we're gone. So then I found SpecRec, Spectrum Recorder, which is part of the GR analysis. And that does something a little bit more sens sensible, where you have like a large ring buffer of memory that the thing records in, and at the same time writes to disk. It doesn't wait for it all to be filled and then write to disk, because then it's so busy writing to disk that it can't take the next samples. And with that, at least at 50 mega samples per second on just one port, it would keep up for hours sometimes, often not. Anyway, if there are people have better ways of recording this, let me know. The timestamp is all also really important. Uh, if you're cross-correlating this data, you need to have a time reference on all your data so you are actually cross-correlating data from the same point in time. And GNU Radio has some facilities for it. M many USAPs, they have like a, a GPS clock. And you can start your flow graph and sync it to GPS. But GPS is not nearly good enough in the timing for what we need, and especially not in the frequency reference, in the, in, in the phase stability. So one of the things I did, and this is actually documented in the Atos knowledge base how you should do this. And it's just unfortunate that every time I write, no, glo uh, every time I write a flow graph, I need to add this in by hand. So you wait for the PPS edge. Then you look at your PC, what time is it now? Or actually, you wait for the PPS, you wait a little bit so that you're sure you're in the middle of the next second. And then you read out your PC time, which is presumably locked to NTP, and then you set that time, you tell your USB at the next rising edge of the PPS, that is gonna be your time, and that actually works. It just takes more than a second to do the synchronization, but that's not an issue. So one of the things I hope to contribute is to actually make this part of UHD again. So now we get to the actual GNU radio part. The data that we process in VLBI is usually done in subbands, and the standards that we use say you use 16 megahertz subbands. So I have a twin rigs, which is sampled at 100 mega samples per second. So the recorded data comes in here as uh, shorts, which are turned into floats. And then the first thing I do is resample it from 100 mega sample per second to only 80, because there's only 80 megahertz of spectrum in it anyway. So that that's block. And then I go to a polyphase filter bank, so I create five channels. And this multiplier and this source, they actually shift the channels with like half a channel. The idea is that the band edges, which are called juice, end up in the same polyphase ch channel, and they go into this null sink. We throw them away. All the other channels, we do the same thing four times, which is we double the sample rate, we shift the spectrum up, and then we throw away the imaginary part, which is actually the same thing as going from complex to real values. We've gone from complex to single sideband, upper sideband. And then we read them out in order in, in, in a particular block size, and then we, over here there are floats, over here we go to 8-bit representation. This should have only been one block, but due to the bug I mentioned earlier, I'm actually doing it in two steps. Over here I bring it down to 8 bits, and then here I have a lookup table to go from 8 bits to 2 bits. This is a homegrown block, a, a new GR block that actually puts the timestamps on it and the name of the, or the, the designation of the telescope and which frequencies, etc. And that makes it standard VLBI data format. So that's why it's called a VDIF block. And finally, we write it to file and then we can put it into the correlator and the correlator will compare it to all the channels from all the other telescopes and get our image. Now using this flow chart, and this, we're now last year, August, we actually did our first VLBI observation with the radio telescope, except it wasn't the first. This telescope did it in 1978. They, ha they borrowed a rubidium clock somewhere. And we did the same thing. We borrowed a rubidium clock, and we cross-correlated between the Westerberg telescope in the Netherlands, our Dwingelo telescope, and the Jodelbank Mark II radio telescope in the UK. And what you see here is time slots and the cross-correlation in each of these time slots. And you see that there's only one peak, which is nicely in the center, which shows that it actually works. Except at that time, we could only record to memory. Uh, we could only record 10 seconds at the time. But that was good enough to show that this works. 
So this is a half hobby, half work. And for work, we got involved in a project called Asterix, which is a European com co uh, Commission uh, Horizon 2020 project. And it, its aim was to address all kinds of interdisciplinary issues in uh, astronomy, astroparticle physics, particle physics, etc. Um, and one of the fields that all of these institutes, all these observatories and experiments suffer with is accurate timing. And White Rabbit is a very interesting way to do it. There were lots of White Rabbit work packages in, the, in this research. And we were going to work with this as well. And we were going to show that White Rabbit as a time and frequency reference distribution is good enough as a time source for, uh, for VLBI. So almost as good as a hydrogen maser clock. So not everyone here is familiar with White Rabbit. On the left, you have a White Rabbit switch. Then you have like optics. And this is not your normal fiber optic stuff. This is only one optical port because you're using the same fiber back and forth in the same, re same direct, uh, sorry, back, on, back and forth on the same fiber. You do it at different wavelengths though. And, and that's why it has only one fiber connected instead of the normal pair connection you would have. So you go through a fiber and at the other end you have another block another optical converter and you have your end point and that gives you out your pulse per second and your 10 megahertz again and it completely compensates for the unknown and changing delay through the fiber. And it does this by measuring the round trip time up to picosecond accuracy. So in our work package we uh, put some interesting challenges. So here you have the Westerberg telescope that I already showed, their hydrogen maser. This is a white rabbit switch, and from there, we could go 67 kilometers to the north, to the city of Groningen, where we did optical amplification and went back to the same place we came from. And then, more optical amplification, and then we would go over 35 kilometers of dark fiber to our radio telescope in Dwingelo. Now, the interesting thing here is that we were able to do this over an existing public dense wavelength division multiplexing network. So we didn't have to run our own fibers. We didn't have to interrupt the existing users of this network, but the tricks we used allowed us to insert these wavelengths outside of the existing wavelengths to add our own amplifiers because White Rabbit only one works on a single fiber. So your amplifiers actually need to be bidirectional, which is very unusual in telecommunication industry and actually raised a few eyebrows when we first discussed it with them. But fortunately, the Dutch uh, research and education network provider, Surfnet, was very willing and interested in helping with this, and we managed to set up this link. And for the people who are actually into synchronization, this is the LN deviation that we got, where the red line and the green line, for red and the blue line, continue into one, one each other, give us the, the actual sheathed um, stability of the clock. And in black, we have the performance that a hydrogen laser would have, according to the sales brochure. So as you can see, everywhere we're like within an order of magnitude of the same stability and at over a thousand seconds, eventually we cross over and even become better. Unfortunately, that's a range where for VLBI it's not that interesting anymore. But we were like within an order of magnitude of what you can do with a hydrogen laser. The problem we had is that the radio telescope in Dwingelo is still like 300 meters away from the building. So then we had to put in some fiber. And like I said, this is half hobby, half work. This was definitely hobby part. So uh, somebody was kind enough to give us 500 meters of fiber. Um, the only problem is it is 144 strands. So it's a little bit more than we needed. And we started, we had to go from here, around the building, there, there, and then through the building. So we rented the digger, dug some fiber or some tubing. Then we inserted the fiber and built a system so that fiber can actually rotate around the axis of the telescope so it doesn't get kinked as we turn the whole bu bu building which turns with the dish. Then we also ended up splicing our own fiber, which is, uh, this is, each fiber here is like an eighth of a millimeter in size. It's really uh, nerve wracking work to do. And what we ended up in the end is, what we ended up with in the end in the inside the Faraday's cage inside the radio telescope was this setup. So you might recognize some of these blocks. This is an X310, and I managed to find an X300 somewhere else, so we have two of them. Uh, this is the incoming fiber, and 
So we had this long 169 kilometer link, and we also had the direct 35 kilometer link, so we could actually compare the performance. And this is the white rabbit switch that takes care of the timing. And this is the second white rabbit switch, so we could run one on the long link and the other on the short link and run them at the same time. Um, actually, these are not, I should also mention that these are not the standard white rabbit switches. You don't get this kind of performance on the standard white rabbit switch. We used uh, an extension to the white rabbit switch, which is called the low jitter daughter board. And on one of the switches, we also had a special cleanup oscillator. And that allowed us to actually get to the performance that we were achieving. So now it's time to show that all of this actually worked. And unfortunately, the project was getting very much at its end. It, it ended in April this year, and by now we are in March. So it's getting a bit tight. But in March, we had an overall network monitoring experiment with like 20 dishes officially participating. And we unofficially participated with our uh, hobby dish as well. Problem is all these observations, VLBI observations at 21 centimeters are at 18 centimeter uh, wavelength, 1650 megahertz, which is slightly higher than the hydrogen line. And the Dwinglow dish didn't have any receivers for that. So we had to install new low noise amplifiers, which <coughs> means you have to get into the elevator. The elevator goes up and then you go to the receiver and then you can pull out the receiver and bring it down with you. It's a lovely picture, except we have wind force six and rain. Yeah. Still, we managed to do this, and we managed to get our first fringes on our remote uh, maser. And what you see here is, again, the amount of cross-correlation for different time offsets. And you see one very nice peak. And this is actually be between the Dwingelo dish and the 100-meter diameter Effelsberg dish. Uh, also, because we last minute bought different preamplifiers. We didn't quite have the sensitivity that we thought we had, but later on I did more observations and um, what you see here in black is the actual performance of the link back to back without doing VLBI and then this again is an Allen deviation. So over here you see the amount of frequency noise and what you see over here is your averaging time. And what you see here is that for the 35 kilometer and for the 169 kilometer. Basically, the performance is exactly the same, but then eventually it starts to diverge, and that is because these me measurements were not done at the same time yet, and you start to see the effects of the ionosphere. Still, we can see that the performance is uh, pretty close to the link performance. We're not losing much. And um, this is actually an observation that, that ran for one and a half hour each. Flow chart I showed earlier, unfortunately runs even on a brand new i9-19900K or something at one-fifth of real time. And that flow chart is actually only a quarter of what I want to do, because the Twinner X actually has four inputs. So having been to previous uh, GNU radio events, I said, I'm going to do this in Arab Knock. Shouldn't be all that hard. I mean, I've got 100 megahertz of uh, data, 100 mega sample coming in. I want to break this down into four channels. And I want to quantize it at only two bits. Because originally I'm getting like 3.2 gigabit per, per, per Twinner X input. But what I actually need is uh, once it's quantized at two bits, it's only 256 megabits. So, and also the X310 has like a huge FBA in it. So this is the progress so far. This is like the, uh, the block that's already in there that gives you your samples uh, out of your XE stream. And then I wrote a fractional resampler, 5 to 4 to go from 100 mega sample to 80. And then I made four DDCs that have a five to one resampler after them so that I would have four streams of 16 mega samples each. Then I wanted to two bit quantize them and interleave them, get the timestamps on it. But actually at this point, my FPGAs are already getting pretty full and I'm not, e not nearly at a quarter of what I actually want to put in there. So if there's people here who are more uh, knowledgeable about Arab Knock, I would definitely like to hear from you. Um, should this even fit? Is this like uh, way too big anyway? And should I find a different solution? So far, we're doing it uh, the slow way, but I would really like to do this in real time. And that sort of brings me to the conclusions from this story. 
We have a working VLBI backend using a, off, a commercial off-the-shelf SDR, and it works. And we can process the data in GNU Radio to get it to the same format that any radio telescope that does VLBI. And we're doing reference clock transfer using White Rabbit, and not just over 10 kilometers, but we can do 170 kilometers um, with a frequency stability that we've calculated is good enough for observations at frequencies up to 14 uh, gigahertz. And we get timing accuracy better than one nanosecond. So yeah, all of that works pretty well, and that is where I break for questions. Thank you. So, uh, you you, uh, you mentioned that the white rabbit switch that you're using uh, isn't, or you, you made a comment that it's somehow different or that uh, you wouldn't be able to get the precision you needed uh, with an actual white rabbit switch. Um, can right. you elaborate on that a little bit? What, what is it, what is the performance of white rabbit naturally lack that you had to make up for? Uh, so it was improved in two ways. The low jitter daughter board really, um, makes the Allen deviation like, I think more than a factor 10 better. And then there was also a cleanup oscillator that takes care of lots of nasty um, ar ar noise spikes that you have in there, or of ice spikes. And the combination gives for, makes, makes for a really clean, clean signal. And I have, uh, from a longer presentation that I can show you, there's, uh, we have pictures and it's also been published how we've, how we've done that. Yeah. We have time for one, oh, there we are. Marcus. So assuming I know a field near Karlsruhe where like 10, three meter dishes stand around, um, how would I go about getting, you know, maybe a reliable clocking signal without running a fiber optic cables? Can I like build something that's based on a radio receiver to discipline a local oscillator? I have to say, I, I hardly could hear you. Oh, sorry, then, yeah. Um, uh, if I have... Okay, if I have a, a dish somewhere a couple kilometers away from my clock source, how would I go about disciplining a local oscillator without running the fiber? Can I do that with like a radio receiver, maybe? Not really something I've looked into. I would say run fiber. It's lots of fun, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, there were no more hands, I think, so... Um, maybe we can have one more round of applause. <laughs> 